everyone and welcome today. I'm Marcy Alberher from Cogenerate, formerly Encore.org, and I'm really excited to kick off this conversation today. Uh, I think this multi-generational workforce um, phrase has been just buzzing around lately. I feel like I'm seeing an article about navigating the multi-generational workforce every time I turn around lately. We know there are memes on Instagram and such, not always positive. I also know, like through our own Google alerts, just how common the phrase multi-generational or um, cross-generational, intergenerational, hopefully co-generational are becoming. So these, um, these, these ideas are really um, in the zeitgeist right now. And I'm really excited um, that today we're going to have a conversation with real experts who have been living and breathing and thinking um, very smart um, about the, the idea of cross-generational collab collaboration. So this event was sparked by the publication of this book, which I've been carrying around and recommending to everyone, Gentelligence. Uh, we have two of the co-authors of that book today um, here with us and also my colleague, Darlene from Encore Fellows. So I'm gonna have everybody introduce themselves in a minute. But I just want to say the goal today is to get us talking. We only have an hour to plant some seeds, to get you all thinking, but you're also going to have a chance for really like a micro seminar on this topic. Um, so uh, we're hoping you're going to leave with lots of ideas to take back to your colleagues, to people you volunteer with, to people you work in in all, in all kinds of ways with, maybe to your family. Um, and we hope to set the stage for conversations we can build on from today. So I'm gonna ask each speaker to introduce themselves uh, with your title and your role here and what brought you to um, what I'll call co-generational work. So Megan, can you kick us off? Certainly. Well, hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. My name is Megan Gerhardt. I am a professor of leadership at Miami University. Uh, I also am a co-author of Gentelligence, as Marthy, uh, Marcy mentioned, and I am a generational consultant and speaker working with companies all over the world on this very issue. So I'm excited to be here today. Darlene, I'm just going order on my screen. Thank you, Marcy. I'm Darlene Johnson. As uh, Marcy said, I am a part of CoGenerate. The program that I work in is the Encore Fellowships Program. Um, we'll talk about that program later, but in a nutshell, we, we place um, retired corporate um, people into fellowships and nonprofits. My personal background in, um, in DEI is that I've spent from my education to my corporate career and to now the social impact work that I, work that I do, um, I have typically been um, in very diverse organizations and settings, um, but have not usually been a part of the prevalent group. And so that just kind of frames my, my references, my background, and also sparked my interest in DEI. And I'm really happy that as a part of the Encore Fellowships Program and Co-Generate, I get to really delve into that work. Great. And Josephine. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Josephine Mackinson Equal. I am Megan's, a former student of Megan's and a co-author of the book. That's really how I got introduced to the topic. But I'm currently working in corporate in the financial services industry, and I think about this all the time and apply the practices daily. So I think we will have an interesting conversation today with how we can adopt and implement some of these changes. Great. And Duncan, I'm just going to ask you to show your face one more time and answer the same question, please. Thank you. Apologies for hiding. Hi, everybody. If you didn't see me before, I'm Duncan. I work on the communications team at CoGenerate. Um, and multi-generational, intergenerational connections, collaboration, working together across generational divides has been important to me for years. Um, so I really got involved with CoGenerate to help advance that work. And I'm so excited to uh, be here today to continue spreading that gospel. Great. Thanks, everyone. And uh, just to get you a sense of what we're going to do here today, we're going to open with what I call the micro seminar from Megan and Josephine. I know you all lead day long sessions and, you know, big, deep dives on this topic. So, but you're going to give us a taste of so that we all leave today really with some knowledge, um, not just some informal chat. Uh, then we're going to have a little panel discussion that will all take us to about 40 minutes or so, and then we're gonna have 15 minutes for Q&A. But I wanna encourage everyone to use the chat box. 
If you're the kind of person who reacts in real time, feel free to do that in the chat. Duncan is gonna be scanning the chat per the Q&A period to surf the, lift up the most prevalent questions so we make sure they get answered in the chat. And if there are really um, juicy questions that we don't get to, we will um, give you ways to uh, get to all of us afterwards to get those questions answered. So um, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Megan and Josephine to give us the micro seminar. Thank you so much. So I wanted to start with just a uh, quick story uh, that I promised Marcy I would share as I pull up the slides. Um, regarding why I'm such a zealot about this topic, I've been working it for about 15 years specifically in this area, and it all comes back to the fact that when I began my career, um, I was a 26 year old. Uh, so I began as a professor when I was pretty young, and I had a lot to learn from of course, my older colleagues, as many of us do. Uh, and so in doing so, I sought out advice and mentorship from people who are older than me, and I learned just a significant amount about that. Um, however, as time went on, I found myself really naturally asking my students, and as Josephine said, she's a former student of mine, uh, for their input and advice. I was a lot closer in age than uh, to my students than I was to many of my colleagues at the beginning of my career. So it was a really natural thing for me. And I, I realized quickly that I was learning a significant amount in both directions, uh, from those younger as well as those older, but very different things. The perspective was different, the expertise and the experience was different, and, and as somebody who studies organizational behavior, I was just fascinated. And so I thought, I'm learning so much, I'm better at my work because I've done this, because I've reached out and, and learned from people both older and younger. So I was really fascinated on how other people were learning and benefiting from this kind of age difference. Uh, I learned pretty quickly that most of us aren't, uh, that my positive view on this was not shared. And so really the focus of the work of Gen Intelligence uh, that Josephine has, has been working on with me uh, and everything that I do is on how do we change this conversation? How do we take what is looked at as a frustration most frequently and make it something more positive? So that's what Josephine and I are going to dive into, uh, as Marcy said, at a very um, high level with everybody today, just to kind of kick off our thinking and our discussion. So as you all know, almost every organization across every industry, whether it's a nonprofit, volunteer, your community, Community, your family is multi generational, and it has been that way for a long time. Uh, however, the reality is almost no organizations strongly agree that their leadership is really equipped to lead these multiple generations effectively, to engage them, to tap into all that expertise, to help them work effectively together. Uh, and that is a stunningly low number, 6%. So for us, that really you know, brought out the question of, what are we leaving on the table in terms of, of potential and learning and growth by the fact that age and generation are left out of almost every conversation uh, regarding uh, diversity and difference? So uh, this is the generation gap that Josephine and I want to talk to you about today, uh, and we're just going to kick off with a quick overview. So uh, any of you that have been to generational training before, that might be a lot of you. Uh, if you if you're hopped on this call, this is probably not your first time thinking about the topic. You have probably seen those PowerPoint slides that have your generation at the top and the years and the four things that happened to you and the three attitudes and the six behaviors that we see from that generation. Uh, we're not here to do that. So if that's what you came expecting, uh, we are not the people for that. That is generational stereotyping, and that is, in our view, part of the problem. So we don't believe people fit just exactly into generational boxes where everyone, of course, thinks and behaves the same. That's kind of silly. Uh, and actually, we think when people talk about wanting to get rid of generations, quote unquote, which you will see pop up every once in a while on your newsfeed, what they're really talking about is pushing back on the idea of generational stereotypes. And we absolutely agree with that. So uh, we think it's really important to understand the complexity of what it means to grow up in a different period of time, the ways in which that might influence your perspective on the world, your work, 
the people around you, the way you view success. Uh, and so we want to really frame how we look at generations as a really important form of difference. Um, and then Josephine is going to share with you the four key practices we've developed um, to really help us activate these ideas and across all of the work that we do. So I want to give just a really quick connect the dots of, of when we talk about generation rather than those neat boxes that often people don't agree with or they don't see themselves in the box that's been put around their generation. Uh, the most effective way to look at generations is as a layer of identity. And I love this concept of layering identity. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but when you think about your generational identity, where those stereotype slides do come from is the idea that we know through research that we all have formative experiences that we go through. Those are roughly things that you experience between age five and 20 when your brain isn't fully formed that really have a more profound effect on you and your life than they might on somebody older. So a great example would be the pandemic, uh, which we've all come out of. Uh, we've all been affected by it, but those young people age five to 20, it will have a more profound effect on their attitudes. And what we have found the most useful term um, and way to look at this is the generational norms that emerge. So we love talking about generational norms more so than anything else, because a norm says, on average, at a group level, we see differences between Gen Xers and Millennials, for example. Doesn't mean every Gen Xer or Millennial acts this way, but over time, we can see some really interesting shifts that really do tend to surface in uh, the way we behave and the way we think at work. So we just wanted to ground everybody in that discussion. So here is the promised discussion about layers. So if you think about a generation as just one layer of your identity, it, it saves us from a lot of the concerns that people often have about generational work. So for example, generation and age are different layers. So I often will, when I do these webinars and keynotes and talks, we'll have people say, well, I'm an older millennial or I'm a younger baby boomer, you know, an asterisk. And that's because age and generation, while obviously connected, are different. They, they can show up very differently in the way that you view things in your experience. You can also put gender identity, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, you know, any part of your identity culture. Uh, where you are in the world and in the way your culture looks at age and things like that can fit into this. Uh, so that kind of interaction we found to really be helpful in that uh, deep discussion of the importance of a generational lens and the fact that the period in time that you grow up in really does have an impact on um, many important aspects of your perspective and experience. All right, so just a couple more for me and then I'll turn it over to Josephine. So the research on this, so I'm in, you know, I have my feet in two worlds, academia as well as consulting and practice. So academically, we've looked through research uh, at the cost of not managing this well. So when we just leave people to their own devices and think that people older and younger are going to be able to figure it out and work together, we're, we're usually quite wrong. So you can see there on the right, the cost of that. Uh, we're seeing in organizations all over the turnover where people are leaving. Uh, we have our older adults leaving to go for the next second or third act career they might be interested in in an organization where they feel more valued for that experience. We have younger people, our Gen Zs and our millennials deciding that uh, they want to go somewhere that's interested in developing, investing in them in the way that they want. Uh, and of course, there can be a lot of uh, costs, things like quiet quitting, uh, knowledge transfer, all of those important costs. Now, the good news is, and the news that we're here to hopefully help you reach is the fact that if we do lead and manage this well, which we believe Gentelligence can help us do, uh, there is a lot of benefit on the other side. So you can see there that it is um, shown to be able to tap into not only complementary abilities and skills, different informational networks, better decision making, better performance. Uh, so definitely worth uh, the investment uh, when you think about it that way. All right, so finally from me, uh, you heard uh, Marcy say the word Gentelligence. That is the title of our book. Uh, it's probably not a term very many people have heard, although we're, that's changing slowly. Uh, so Gentelligence is a term that I came up with about five years ago, and it hopefully makes sense to you when you hear it. Um, it's really all about this idea that we need to get smarter about um, generational diversity, the fact that people with different kinds of experience and expertise based on their uh, time in which they grew up and the skills and things that they've 
you know, grown up learning how to do, um, that that's really powerful in terms of intergenerational learning and collaboration, that there's a lot of potential uh, if we can normalize the fact that every generation has something to teach as well as something to learn, that we should be open to learning from people who are younger. I learn significant amounts from my students every single day, um, as well as, of course, learning from those who are older and vice versa, that there's there's teaching that can happen on both ends. So um, that's really what Gentelligence is all about. It's about reframing something that has been traditionally looked at as a threat and a frustration uh, instead as an opportunity. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josephine, who will uh, take us through our four Gentelligence practices. Thank you so much, Megan. And now everybody's an expert on intelligence, and we will, can just end from now. But no, we can't. There's much more to learn, and this it, this will only cover a very brief overview of what the book actually covers. But what we hope to clarify here are the four intelligence practices. And intelligence is really achieving two goals, which is one is to break down bias and stereotypes and tension between generations, and then using building the capacity to actually leverage generational diversity and age diversity in the workplace. So the first two, identify assumptions and adjust the lens, are those things that we need and the practices, the practices that we need to apply in order to break down bias and tension. And the following, the build trust and expanded pie, are those that we actually need to strengthen and hone all the muscles we need to build in order to actually actively and proactively leverage the capacity to unlock the potential of generational differences in the in the workplace. So Megan, I think we can switch to the, the next page. So we're going to go through each of them in turn. And while you can certainly start anywhere you want, if there's something that speaks to you, we do tend to speak to them in this order. So the first one, identify assumptions. It's very, actually, every human, everybody makes automatic connections. It served us humans very well in terms of survival for a very long time. But stereotypes can also cause a tremendous, a huge problem. But the problem with stereotypes is actually not that they are untrue, but that they paint an incomplete picture of a person or a people or a story or a place. And what we urge people to do as part of this practice is actually to replace those stereotypes with personal connections so that you can get a more complete picture and a fuller story of that generation in this case. So what we've listed here in the bottom is actually at intelligence questions, which is actually helping us get behind the, beyond the stereotypes and actually resist assuming things about people and instead uh, look across the generations to where we can see um, see where we connect and also just a fuller picture of the individual and uh, the generation which they belong to. So I think the next slide, Megan, thanks. So once we've broken down the stereotypes and identified the stereotypes, it's time for us to adjust the lens. So some of us wear glasses, some that you can see, but generational identities, as Megan has pointed out, which is a layer of your identity, is also a set of glasses, but not everybody wears the same glasses. So what we really urge people to do as part of this practice is to choose curiosity over judgment and adjust your lens to understand and identify the intent and interest that's been highlighted here on the page. But really, if you're trying to understand and adjust the lens in the workplace, what you can do is to ask, help me understand X. That will help you prompt the conversation around why you may look at things differently, and it may actually signal to the other person that you have chosen curiosity over judgment. So once we have identified uh, uh, re resist assumptions and also uh, adjusted the lens, it's time for us to think about how we can strengthen the capacity to leverage um, generational diverse, diversity in the workplace. And now we have focused on building trust. For those of you who have studied maybe psychological safety or something similar, this is very connected to that. But really here we're focused on making everybody feel welcome, trusted and um, included in the conversation, which allows us to actually have more open conversations and share ideas, and it will help us actually unlock the potential where generational, intergenerational teams or intergenerational workplaces actually result in better outcomes. And then the last piece is expand the pie. Some of you may know this from negotiation strategy. It's a very simple concept in a sense that you have one pie, you're trying to split it up. If you do it, as a zero sum game, nobody ever gets more pie than the other one. And instead, if you collaborate and partner together, you can both get 
get more pi, even though the ratio by which you're splitting it actually stays the same. So here, it's about not viewing the other generation as a competitor or somebody that you have to elbow your way around, but actually seeking out ways in which we can work together to create more value. Excellent. Thank you so much. I don't think we've ever gone through them that fast. So I'm impressed. <laughs> and that was a good, that was, was a good hit time. on all four. So, you know, we have like 300 it. pages in the book on those, but uh, for the, you know, a benefit of time and we want to get to the panel, um, there's a, a QR code that we have if anybody wants to get a free intelligence exercise to use uh, with their team or learn more, you can definitely uh, dive deeper there. Uh, so we just, just wanted, so wanted to include that in case people want to want to dig in a little further. But with that, um, I'll also put that link in the chat if anybody wants it. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Marcy uh, for our next conversation. Great, thank you two so much. And to address, in case people aren't monitoring the chat, those slides for your use only will be included in the follow-up email, including the QR code. So if you don't have time to do that during the webinar, you are not missing your chance. So Darlene, I'd love to bring you into the conversation now. And I'd love you to give us a sense of um, what the Encore Fellowships program is and how it relates to this cross-generational interaction and collaboration conversation. All right, great. Thanks, Marcy. So let me just explain what the Encore Fellowships Program is for people who are not familiar. So the Encore Fellowships Program is a program within CoGenerate, formerly Encore.org. Um, and we focus on basically the aspects of more like Encore careers. We take um, corporate retirees, typically corporate, retirees and place them in fellowships in a nonprofit organization. Um, our retirees are seasoned professionals with typically decades of experience that are looking for a new, new type of work, right, in a new environment um, where they've left that, you know, what I'm going to call the rigors of, of corporate America and decided that now they've reached the stage in their life where they want to focus more on their personal satisfaction, their contributions to society, and are looking to figure out how to make that transition. The Encore Fellowships Program is a wonderful way to do that. Let me also be fully transparent and state that I was an Encore Fellow. I just don't want, don't just talk about them on webinars. Um, I actually retired from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, um, became an Encore Fellow, and then became um, a CoGenerate employee. So I have been across on both sides of this uh, particular scenario. But as we as we place Encore Fellows in nonprofit organizations, there's obvious benefit. Our value proposition is that we get, nonprofits get seasoned, highly skilled talent in a high impact engagement that they wouldn't necessarily be able to afford on the open market. They also are age, continuing to age diversify their organization and their team as well. Because like I said, our our fellows are retirees, so they are technically of a certain age, um, and we place them in, in nonprofits, which may or may not have a large proponent of their organization that comes from that age group. And so there's that diversification. So as we talk about DEI, you got to start with the D, right? You've got to build the diversity in. And then as we have have 12 plus years of wonderful experience, great stories from our fellows and our hosts and our sponsors, I mean, our nonprofits and our sponsors. Um, it's a wonderful thing, but you've got to progress beyond D, right? You can't stay in diversity because the value of diversity is not the metric. It's not looking at the numbers. It's the value that that brings. And so to really be able to take advantage of that, one, you have to be cognizant of it. And then you have to work to be intentionally inclusive. And so the, the wonderful thing about what you've just heard um, is that this is how, this is the how, right? Um, and I think it's just really important. Um, what we tell our fellows and our nonprofits is that we've given them, you know, that there's, there's great talent and include, like I said, increased diversity, but now you also have to like realize the superpower that that brings, right? That superpower is determined by how you provide inclusion, how you make sure that you, you know, make a space where people are comfortable and open to contribute. Um, we tell our, our fellows to really look for reciprocal mentoring relationships where they can connect with a younger person in the organization 
And as Megan said earlier, they need to be able to learn from them as well as teach. And so it's it's bi-directional. Um, it's not the standard thing we get in corporate America. And we don't, you know, we're when you're on the corporate side, you know, they kind of train you, especially if you've been a people manager, to, to have a filter. There are things you don't talk about, right? And we don't talk about age. We don't talk about differences per se. Um, now it's important to do that if we do it in an important way where we realize the contributions. And so that is the way it works. We've always had the superpower, but um, it wasn't really the focus of our of our um, of our value proposition. And so now the way I state this, which makes uh, makes Marcy smile, as I said that we've taken um, the power of of this age, you know, of well, and this is, let me rephrase that. The ability to co-generate, right, to work across generations for for good is was really kind of like the bonus or like the gravy um, in what we were doing. And now we're really looking at it more like from an entree perspective where this is what we should focus on. And so as our mission has progressed, we're really looking at honing in on how we can be intentionally inclusive and really increase um, collaboration, community problem solving um, with the diversity that's been created within the organizations through the Encore Fellowships Program. You're on mute, Marcy. We'll be, sorry, we'll be hearing more about the Encore Fellows um, as we go along, but um, I just wanna, before we go anywhere, I like Duncan, we didn't look at the poll results and I'd love to just see how people are feeling in the room about this topic. And, Cause I think it might influence how all of us speak to these things. So let's just see. So, First question was generational differences have caused challenges in my work. And the this is not a big, a big concern, it seems. The biggest group is um really, oh no, I'm sorry. It is, it is a concern. That 36%, I was looking at it backwards. 36% is a pretty high number. So when you add 36 and 10, that's 40, nearly half of the people on this call have had experiences where generational differences have caused a challenge in their work. Um, my generational is misunderstood. People are kind of neutral on that. That is where um, I think the crux is coming. And then the last one is groups I work with know how to lead a multi-generational team effectively. Um, and I would say, again, not a lot of strong agreement on that. So I think there is work that we can all do uh, to get better, but let's just keep those, those kind of responses in our head as we go through um, the rest of this conversation. So you are all thinking about this issue all the time. So I guess that the question I have, and, uh, and, and I'm gonna, for each question, I'm gonna say I'd like two of you to answer. Um, which is what trends are you seeing now um, around the generational conversations? And to just switch it up, Darlene, do you want to kick this one off? I'm sorry, I was all caught up in reading the comments. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot With of all the these on poor fellows like just chiming in. I got all overly excited. Yeah, yeah. Can you rephrase the restate the question? Yeah, yeah, Darlene, what trends are you seeing these days around the intergenerational, cross-generational conversation? Yeah, so I think the, what I'm hearing, at least from, like I said, from the Encore Fellowship's perspective, are um, challenges around communication. Communication just really kind of rings and resonates um, with a lot of people, um, and so. That's really kind of what I'm hearing. I think people are cautious or um, concerned about being misunderstood um, or um, feeling that they can't connect, right? So I think there's that connection challenge that I think that some folks have um, struggled with. Mm -hmm. So Megan or Josephine? I'll, I'll jump in. Um... I, I think, you know, as I've been been working with different clients of different sizes, uh, I, of course, agree with the communication. That's something that's a little thing that that ends up becoming a big thing when people get their wires crossed and, and are interpreting with maybe judgment more than curiosity as to why people are, are choosing different channels. But uh, on a broader organizational level, one of the things I've seen shift over the last year or two is a shift from 
employee resource groups. So groups dedicated to, let's say, baby boomers, millennials, like Gen Xers, um, were not common when we were researching the book back in 2019, but they did exist at certain, you know, forward thinking organizations to not a lot of success. And that's because like a lot of resource groups, if you only are, are surrounding yourself with, with people that are having the same challenges or the same views, you know, then you're missing a big part of the, the crowd that needs to be there. So the shift I've been most excited about on a really positive note is I'm starting to see intergenerational uh, employee resource groups. So where um, they are people across every age and generation and career stage who are really interested in learning and teaching others and, and people coming together for that purpose. And that's what we really need to see to create that gentelligent culture uh, rather than just isolating those groups. Um, so that's a trend I'm seeing that I really love. Uh, mutual mentorship is uh, along with that, that we're seeing that as well. I have a bunch, but those are just a couple that come to mind right away. I'm not letting you off the hook, Josephine, because you said something super interesting when we <laughs> talked the other day. So can you share the insight you shared with me? Well, I think uh, the top line or the tagline for mine is sort of the mainstreaming of some of these ideas. So the issue of generational conflict and diversity and tension and bias and everything that comes with that is more often talked about. And I think it's migrated from the people organizations and the HR departments into the workplace as now ev every single workplace almost is multi-generational. So as a result, more and more people have personal stories and connections and are able to replace some of their maybe stereotypes with some of that more nuanced picture, but really the mainstreaming of these ideas The and actually on my way to work today, I got two commercials for how to overcome generational differences in the workplace, which I thought was very interesting, but it is really everywhere. And I think it is also in our workplaces, which I think not just in our HR departments or our people departments, but really managers are paying a lot of attention to it everywhere. Yes, and your phone is also eavesdropping on you and knows what you were doing. <laughs> well, so we know well that. maybe, right. but I, I've that. never gotten one before. <laughs> exactly. So, I, you know, you already, um, the, comp, the topic of communication has come up already. Darlene, you mentioned it right away. Um, so I think we should just go back there. Um, and Megan, I just have to, you know, ask you because we all, every article I read about this topic, um, every time I hear somebody speak, they begin with a story about miscommunication, um, about crossed wires, about differences in tools or medium. Um, so my, my question really is, how important is, 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 it, is communication um, kind of a red herring or is it really um, an important issue that is an entry point for a lot of people into the generational conversation? Oh, I, I think it's absolutely important. It is something that can, you know, be part of an everyday low level irritation that can build over time. It's how we do work. It's how we build relationships and trust. Um, we share in the book, and then we also shared in our Harvard Business Review article on gen intelligence that came out last year, which I know that you're going to share with everybody um, we shared a story about some intergenerational teams working together. It had older retired adults and it had uh, university students working together on a really important and interesting project. And there was a lot of tension surrounding what seems like a small issue, which was choice of communication channels. So if we go back to the idea of norms. Um, the fact that older people are, you know, presumed or stereotyped not to know how to use technology is completely inaccurate. There's no research supporting that. What's important and, and interesting, and this is where complexity and, and evidence matters, is that we do know that older people are sometimes less interested in using technology as constantly or as pervasively as younger people, um, as a norm, not by the person. Um, but that can mean they may not necessarily want to be, use the same sorts of tools and channels all the time because that's not what their preferred norm is. And so, uh, you know, the the story we got when we interviewed them was the younger members of the team were using text as their preferred uh, channel for communication. They were texting whenever they had an issue or a question or an idea. Um, and sometimes it was, you know, mid evening, getting something squared away for the next day. And what started happening as a, as a pattern was that these texts would come from the younger team members in the evening. The older people wouldn't 
usually respond for a number of reasons. Some said that's my family time. I'm not, you know, I've, I'm not interested in communicating about work after a certain time. Others said I text with friends and family. It's not the tool I want to use to communicate with colleagues. It seems too informal, different reasons. Um, but the younger people were then interpreting the lack of response as a lack of respect. Um, and so very quickly, something that seems minor uh, ended up escalating to some tension that had to be addressed directly. So those are the kinds of things where we recommend, you know, it's not my way or your way. It's can you help me understand why you're not responding to those texts or why you choose text over email or in person, you know, that that sort of practice around um, becoming curious and then deciding, well, we all have different norms for great reasons, but what's our team norm going to be? What's our goal and how do we reach it together? What's going to make the most sense for the way that we work together and something we can agree upon? So it's not a red herring. It's one of those very visible, you know, artifacts that bubble up that can really suggest some deeper issues for sure. Uh, indeed. Um, Darlene, you had an example of a communication thing that I think would resonate with a lot of people in the room. Could you share that? Yes. So this was um, actually not my story, but it was a story from um, a nonprofit that we work with. And this instance happened before we placed Encore Fellows there. But the organization um, leadership team was relatively young. They, I want to say maybe a 15-year age spread, but starting in 20s oldest person at the team was probably 40. Um, and they had a, a newsletter that they did on a regular basis out to all of their constituents um, in, in their city. And they had made a decision to take it from being print to being digital. Um, made sense, more cost effective. Um, they all agreed it was the right thing to do. They did that and then they got so many complaints because a large part of their, well, at least a significant part of their uh, constituents were also um, elder people um, who did not necessarily have access, um, all of a sudden thought the newsletter was gone, um, were not happy about that. Um, and so it wasn't something that crossed the minds of the leadership team as they were making this change because there wasn't anybody representing um, that age group, um, or at least that demographic on their team. And so after they got these complaints, they went back and said, okay, we're, we'll do both, right? So they'll do print for those that need print, and then they'll also do digital. Um, and then of course, after that scenario, we did place a marketing communications fellow on their team um, that is of a different generation, um, as well as a, another person to help them with their leadership academy as well. But it's kind of like you don't know what you don't know. And some things probably could have been avoided had they had different representation at the table when the decision was being made. Yeah. I'm gonna to pop to another topic here. And we've already been talking about DEI a lot. And even though um, many of us know that um, age is not even part of most um, measured DEI initiatives. I think, Megan, the, the data you cite is something like less than 8% uh, of DEI policies include a reference of age. That's, that's correct, right? Yeah, it depends on the source. So uh, Society of Human Resource Management found 8%. And then I've been working with AARP recently. Their evidence is more encouraging. They have a close to 50, but it depends on what we mean by include. So often it means it's in a very long laundry list of things that we say we care about versus actually having activation or strategy. It also depends if we look at just the US or globally, but regardless, the number is, is astonishingly low. Yes. So that just brings me to the question, DEI is coming up a lot and we, we included this in the way we framed the conversation about working across generations. So I'd like each of you to share a reflection on how you see age as part of the DEI conversation. Megan, I just want to, or sorry, uh, Marcy, I just want to butt in because we got a question about this. Not everyone knows that DEI stands for diversity, equity, oh. and inclusion. I just thought that was important to do before we, we all, before we all run around in this circle. So thank you. I'm a big yeah. fan of de jargoning and there I did. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Who wants to, who wants to go first on that one? Darlene? Sure. Um, from my perspective, um, 
and this was part of this was driven actually by by our organization's name change to code generate so when we you know when we talked about encore fellowships everybody knew what encore meant right second acts we you know we did a really good job of branding um and then when we started talking about code generate and code generation and um bringing age into this um we found that people were so open and realized that they had a need, right? Which was, um, I wasn't sure how that was gonna play, right? So I know from our nonprofit organizations, I had so many people said, oh, that's awesome. Please count us in. We need help um, because we don't know um, how we can do that. Everybody had, like I said, a diverse population, but didn't really necessarily look at that population with a, with a lens of, of age or generation or life stage. Um, and so they were just really willing to, to learn um, and to progress, um, which I really appreciate it. They're looking for resources and tools um, from our, on the other side of that, from a Encore Fellows perspective, a lot of our fellows, like I said, in that came from corporate roles, um, didn't necessarily speak of age in that context. Um, a lot of people were concerned, you know, as you have workforce reductions and things of that nature, that they tend to look at them as being a little age centric and not in a positive way. Um, but they've always been in, in multi-generational environments. It just hasn't been something that they've really looked at from even an employee resource group perspective. It's what, like Megan was saying, they're, they're, they segregate themselves into these, these groups, but they don't look across unless there's some other common thread. So whether it's um, race or ethnicity, ethnicity, and then it could be across generations, but it wasn't necessarily something that was looked at and focused on, um, valued as a part of um, their larger DEI initiative. So there was, to me, from a corporate perspective, we saw less recognition, but from a nonprofit side, we saw recognition and willingness. Interesting. Megan, I know you recently did an entire uh, presentation on this very topic, so I, I know that I'm asking you to distill some key nuggets for us, but you're good at that. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely, um, you know, found this fascinating. I was asked to uh, open a webinar for the Future of Work Institute. They had experts on talking specifically about how differences in how professionals talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in organizations could have an age or a generational element to it. So I only had, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. I'm getting pretty good at distilling it down. But um, I think my view in, in the way we set the stage on this was the fact that, of course, just like many other things, the time in which you grew up, these norms, you know, what, what was the stigma around talking about difference? How did people talk about it? When were they supposed to talk about it? What value was placed on it in an organization? And what were the things that had surfaced in, in society or in the culture at that time as being really paramount? And so um, among many other things, we had experts come on and talk about um what we call different groups. So for example, uh, Hispanic to Latino to Latinx to different things like that. Um, there was a really fascinating conversation about um, sexual uh, preferences, uh, gender identity, um, LGBTQ+, uh, many things around um, a very quickly evolving area of difference. Uh, there were several prof professionals on there that were talking about, um, they were baby boomers saying when they entered into working in diversity and inclusion, for example, the word queer was not socially acceptable, it was offensive, and they won't use it in the work they do. And they had younger colleagues who have embraced that term and sort of taken ownership over it as saying, we use it now and we're very comfortable with it. And that's creating some you know, challenges around uh, norms there. Uh, and then even just what is, uh, you know, with pronouns, things like that, and people now um, being very 
uh, comfortable and wanting people to respect their pronouns and, and younger people growing up with that. I have a 17 year old that's very um, clear about the fact that you need to respect everyone's pronouns. Um, but for the people who didn't grow up with that, even if they very much want to respect everything about someone, um, it takes some time to learn and, and remember. And that also is, is a learning curve for a lot of people. So there were a lot of topics around diversity and inclusion um, where you know, and maybe the last thing I'll say about this, Marcy, is I was working with a really great client that I did a number of workshops for where the biggest issue they were having turned out to be largely generational in nature. And that was that it was an organization that was trying to be um, really proactive around social justice issues. And their younger members wanted things to change right away and change quickly. And, and if you care about it, you'll act now. Um, their older members were trying to be a little more cautious and thoughtful about, you know, when we do this, how we do it, let's not move too quickly if we really want to make meaningful change. Um, and the tension it was causing was the fact that the younger members in the organization were perceiving the slow move as, well, then you don't really care. And then the older people in the organization were largely feeling like moving quickly was impulsive and short-sighted. And so again, it was a generationally rooted issue on something very important that was causing a lot of tension about strategy and decision making. So we really had to dissect the, the layers there. And, and I think that's where we want to be really careful that we're not stereotyping, we're not assuming someone's intent, um, because we may need to take a step back and adjust the lens that way. Um, so could go on forever, but those are, I know we have a lot of Q and A, but those are just some of the things that have surfaced in the conversations I've had around that. Excellent. Josephine, um, I had a question that does tells really nicely with some questions we've gotten from people in the audience. And I think it's important to say that you bring, um, another kind of difference to this panel in that you have a big sensibility, um, at least in terms of some overseas responses on these questions. And I know when we talked, um, the whole idea of how, how diversity is even talked about in other countries is an interesting issue. So I guess I wanted to get to um, how you, your familiarity with how this um, cross-generational uh, dialogue is showing up outside of the US, and even if that's very specific to Europe. Yeah, thank you. And I think um, we touch on this a little bit in the book, but it's actually a very complicated and delicate conversation. The terms of just how we define the different generations are very Western in nature, like boomers, that's a baby boom after World War II, clearly would not resonate if you are not geographical, that would, wouldn't make sense. Uh, I think in, um, in Sweden, where I'm from, we have a generation basically called like the meatball mountain, which is sort of our equivalent of people that are not moving away or not moving out of the workforce when they should. Uh, but so I think uh, it's um, what I would add to the conversation about the DNI and generational diversity is that a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs formally, if you look at the definition on that on Google, includes just differences of or programs that further or support inclusion of various groups. Age is often recognized as one of those areas, but the other, and but we also we, but we see that they're not actually implemented, which is what the stat that Megan has talked about. But what I always keep in mind when I think about this topic in general is that it varies so much across the globe. And while generational issues, tension and bias has caught on as a wildfire, I mean, if you look at what happened with the baby boomer, just an okay boomer term, like that caught on as a wildfire across the globe. But if you're actually trying to address these issues, you need to be very sensitive to the local and local cultural historical sensitivities when you implement, because yes, baby boomer and okay boomer as a term really signal that this is an issue every, everywhere, but how you talk about it won't actually resonate and it won't make any sense if you're not aware of the cultural and historical and local differences. So the Swedish example is a good one, but I also know that there are many interesting examples from Latin America, South Korea, also um, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates, but Western Europe and United States has some overlap in terms of how we think about the generational differences and also the groupings themselves. 
but I'm sure Megan can add to some of this as well. But this uh, this is always something that I think to another we topic. need to keep in mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift to another question because we have so many good ones, and uh, this question really uh, speaks to something we at Cogenerator are pretty interested in ourselves. Beyond internships, uh, what trends are you noticing with organizations, not just youth serving uh, nonprofits, for example, but uh, that hire those under 18 as thought partners or co-strategists? So we're interested in, have, have you seen any trends of real, um, you know, the kind of youth partnering, Megan, that you talk about doing with your students? Um, are you seeing this happening and showing up in any interesting ways in workplaces? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's important to note the barriers to entry for young people in a lot of spaces have gone down because of their tech savviness. You know, I don't take anything away from their tech savviness, but you know, whether you know, it used to be you had to wait for somebody to seed your company, and that you know, it cost a lot, and it was hard to get anyone's attention. And and now, you know, a really great uh, Instagram feed or a YouTube channel is is accessible. Uh, very accessible to our, our Gen Zs. So uh, I think definitely, yes, you know, I've seen some really interesting, I think Kellogg, I don't know if Josephine will remember, but when we were researching from the book, we were turning over every rock to figure out who's doing this well, in what ways, what are the really unique strategies companies were using? And I think it's Kellogg that I remember um, reading about. Um, they set up sort of a, um, a lab for, at the time, it was, you know, I think, tweens and teens and kids around, you know, that's kind of their target demographic for their cereal market. And so they were tapping into their opinions, you know, they were kind of letting them innovate and, and give feedback. And, you know, the idea that we can only learn things from people older than us is a very antiquated concept. Everybody on the call knows that. Um, but I think we have this very, um, outdated view of ourselves as experts and professionals that if we ask other people for input, particularly people who are younger, we're somehow suggesting that, that we aren't experts or that we can't be respected. When in fact, asking other people for input, whether they're seven or 70, is actually a fantastic way, not only to build respect for yourself, but to engage other people. And so, yes, not only are we seeing companies started by eight and nine and 10 year olds, but we're seeing uh, companies reach out to them. We're seeing lots of nonprofit spaces and volunteer organizations that are harnessing what younger people grow up learning that the rest of us have to learn more on a curve. Tech is the easiest example, but there are other examples. Um, and, you know, whether that's, you know, organizations that pair, uh, I saw, there's a great one called uh, Papa Pals that we put in the book. So it's um, teenagers and college students paired with older adults for companionship, for uh, activities. Uh, we've seen all kinds of uh, living situations where young adults are living with um, older people, you know, companionship and mutual sort of uh, complementary needs and interests. So absolutely, we're seeing this. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's how we innovate. That's how we, we learn and grow for sure. Uh, there's a question that that I think was addressed to um, cogenerate in how we structure these webinars that I can't help um, wanting to give our answer and then see if Megan or Josephine has any comment on this because maybe we need to learn on this, which is that we collect uh, demographic data on age when people register for our, our webinars. And the reason we do that is we want to know who we're speaking to because we can't tell if we are actually attracting an age diverse group if we don't ask. So it's helping us to understand if we are actually reaching people of various ages. So what, by collecting that data, and we think that's similar to other kinds of demographic data that is collected to help people see if they're doing better on other diversity metrics. Is there anything we should be cautious about when doing that or others who host webinars like this should be thinking about? Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, Marcy. I saw that comment too. So um, I want to just say something and and then turn it over to Josephine or Darlene for more um, feedback. But 
I'm someone who's very proud about generational identity. I always worry when somebody, you know, on a workshop says, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm technically a millennial, but I'm not a millennial, or I don't like to think of myself as a boomer because it's sort of underlying the, you know, the underlying problem there that it's showcasing is somehow we've made people feel ashamed about some part of, of their, their identity. And of course, they're talking about the stereotypes associated with that, that they don't fit those, they don't agree with those, and, and we absolutely support that. But generational shaming is part of the problem. You know, we've socially constructed generations. It's an art, not a science. That's a whole other webinar. But the idea that the time in which you grew up brought you skills and experiences, the, the, the way in which you've gone about your life and your career that should be valued, not shamed. And so I think I'm not opposed to asking what generation someone is. I do that at a lot of my workshops, mostly because we can then look at it and say, well, what a tremendous amount of age and generational diversity we have here to learn from. Um, and so I think the fact that people, you know, might be uncomfortable around identifying the generation they're in is a big symptom of the fact that we've handled this conversation in an entirely inappropriate way for a long time. Um, so my, my goal with the work that Gentelligence does would be for people to embrace and say, yes, I'm part of this generation. Here's what that looks like for me. It might not look like that for a lot of other people because of all these layers of who I am, but it also brings me a lens that I think is really important and beneficial uh, is, and can complement the lens of other people who are different ages than me. So um, that would be my two cents, Marcy. Okay. Okay. All right, we, um, we have to come to a close. So I am going to do a, a little rapid fire round robin here. And I'm gonna ask each one of us, each one of you to give a try this at home tip that everyone in the webinar could use in the coming week as they walk about their life or work to kind of have these ideas stay present and top of mind. Darlene, would you wanna kick us off? Sure. So for me, I think it's important for us to look at the circles that we are in. So your social circle, your work circle, um, and see what it, the cognizant, you know, look and see what it looks like. Is it, is, is there diversity in that circle? Um, is there age diversity in that circle? And if there isn't, be, be intentional about trying to expand it. Um, and when you do that, I think a, an approach is to approach it from a, when you have somebody new, a, from a storytelling perspective, right? Because that's, an, um, I think, a non-confrontational, non-intimidating way is for somebody to tell their story, because only that person is the subject matter expert on their own story. Um, there's nothing to argue about. It's not contentious. It's your story. Um, so that would be what I would look at as a kind of try it at home tip. Thanks, Josephine. So I had one prepared, but now I'm going to change it based on some of the questions that we received. <laughs> and I and I think um, Megan started with this sort of every generation has something to teach and something to learn. And I did think I saw some questions in the chat that was around sort of how do I make sure that my maybe I'm able to pass on my wisdom? How do I overcome or build a bridge between different generational um different generations. So I think the one that I will bring uh, to the table for today is uh, think about what different types of knowledge different groups bring. Mm -hmm. So we there are different types of knowledge. We if you are a, belong to an older generation, older generation, you have wisdom that others don't. If you belong to a younger generation, you may have an inclination to challenge things faster than others because you're not so entrenched in your ideas or beliefs. You may also have just graduated from school and you have the latest and greatest on certain technology. But these are different types of knowledge. And it's when we bring those together that we can actually sort of really create magic. So I think that's the one that is sort of, it, there's just not one knowledge. It's just one, not just one thing. So think about the different types of knowledge that everybody brings. Take us home, Megan. All right, she set me up well. So um, mine is the, I call it kind of my magic power question. So I got, I did see a lot of questions in the chat about I have all this knowledge and experience. I'm sad that other people don't want to learn that from me. And I, I think I work with Gen Z every day. Before that, it was millennials. And I can honestly tell you one of the most simple but powerful strategies I've used is 
you know, laying out what the goal or the vision is or what we're there for, making sure everybody's on the same page. And then I love to turn to people who are younger than me and say, I'd love to know how you would approach that. Tell me how you would do it because you're showing them respect. We know our younger generations are incredibly interested in having voice and input and being heard. And when that happens, I get a dozen ideas. Some of them are crazy. Some of them are amazing. Some of them are illegal. Like it just depends on the day and the topic. They're raw often, but there's always something good and interesting. And then the magical thing that happens is when I ask that, then when I respond and say, oh, I love that, that third idea. Can we dig into that? I have a couple questions or, or a few things we'd have to work around in my experience. You know, we're going to run into these things. How would we navigate that? And then, you know, what ends up happening is they are much more likely to hear my experience, my wisdom, my mentorship, because I first was interested in their input. So it's mutual respect where they think, well, she's not lecturing me. She's genuinely interested in helping me move my idea forward and, and for us to collectively be successful. And that's what intelligence is really all about. Well, you did bring us home and right on time because we like to respect people's time in addition to everything else they bring to a setting. So everyone, um, this, this chat is still on fire. It is not stopping. The Q and A's have been nonstop. So um, there's clearly a, a lot of interest in this topic. You're going to get a follow-up email that's loaded with resources and way to, ways can, to continue more to learn um, from all of us and especially from Megan and Josephine. And this, as I said at the beginning, is just the beginning of a conversation that we are going to be continuing um, uh, for quite a long time. So thanks for joining us today and look for that email in your inbox. And thanks so much, Darlene, Megan, Josephine, and Duncan.